This morning, he gave me kind of latitude to teach on whatever for Sunday school or our service, whatever we call it. Um, so I decided to do an overview of the Apostles' Creed. I uh, talked with Ben about it. He had asked me maybe doing a series on it next uh, after Christmas in January. So we, we might do that. We'll see what he wants to do. But <clears throat> I'm going to use the notes largely <clears throat> Excuse me, that I used uh, for some of you remember, I, Stephanie and I lead the uh, campus ministry over at the Citadel. And last, let's see, when did we do it? Last fall, I think. I did a series on the Apostles' Creed with them, and so I'm just going to kind of borrow from that. But we say the Apostles' Creed every Sunday, but really, where does it come from? What's it mean? What's it all about? Hopefully, I don't know if you've ever thought of it. Maybe you have, if you've ever um, studied it, but it's worthwhile taking and pausing and taking a look at. And so I've got, I brought a few other books, but I'll just show you one that if, if you're really curious and you want to read something, it's an overview of the Apostles' Creed. J.I. Packer, who, who passed away just recently, um, I would say is probably the best quick overview of the Apostles' Creed. Where did it come from? What's it all mean? What, where did we get this? Why do we say it? So it's a short, I mean a little over 100 pages, so, but very good. It's like a lot of Packer's works, very accessible, but yet at the same time, there's a lot of depth to it, so you'll get plenty out of it, but, um, and, and try to make, hopefully make this a little bit interactive, and not just listen to me for, you have to listen to me twice, so if you don't interact, it's going to get long, but um, any thoughts or y'all, what do you know of the Apostles' Creed? Anybody know much about it or he thought much about it? Again, we say it every Sunday, pretty much, that or the Nicene Creed. Uh, there are three creeds, we'll say that, that are considered the ecumenical creeds of the church, that um, the church in general, the large, we speak of the large church. Um, you can even include Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox that affirm three creeds. And that's the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, and the Athanasius Creed, which is a little bit different, it's a little bit longer. You're not going to say that one on a Sunday morning, or that would take most of your time. But uh, the Apostles' Creed is the shortest, but um, it has the, we call it the Apostles' Creed, and there was a myth that persisted for a long time within the church of that it was written by the apostles. That's not true. If you've heard that, it, you know, there was kind of this, like a lot of things, myths and things grow up around certain things, and so uh, one of the things with it was is that each of the 12 apostles each wrote one sentence in it, and so you have 12 statements, and then you got 12. So it's not true. It's a nice little story, but it's not. And so the Apostles' Creed really developed from the earliest times of the church. It started out as a baptismal creed. And so baptism was much different in the early church than it was for us. Um, we'll go into all the details, but it was quite interesting. And this was one thing they had to affirm, is this creed grew. And at times, people, you know, depending on different churches in different ways, the thought, do you baptize someone as soon as they make a confession of faith? You know, baptize infants, we do that. But as an adult, if they make a confession of faith, all right, do you baptize them the next day? Do you wait? The early church waited, and a lot had to do with persecution and taught them. And one of the tools they used to teach was the Apostles' Creed. And so it was this simple statement, and they would go through a year, sometimes up to three years, before they would be allowed to be baptized into the church, and usually on Easter. And it was a very elaborate ceremony, and very interesting to study the history of baptism, if you're a history person, just to see how it's changed and evolved over time. But the Apostles' Creed... Uh, any, well, I'll just say this, you know, it started around the second century is when you see the first, um, first forms of it. Its current form is about from the fifth century. So it's a historical, um, very historical document. It goes way back. Uh, it's not seen a lot of change. Uh, it, once it evolved and got into its situation, its current it form. Precedes the Nicene Creed. Mm -hmm. Yep. In its earliest forms, yes. And so um, this one, you know, and without getting too far off, you know, the Nicene Creed was altered a little bit. There's a big, you know, East and West Church, Orthodox and, and Western Church have a different version. Not so with the Apostles' Creed. 
it's pretty much the same. You might find a few words that are slightly different, but, um, but in it overall, it's pretty much the same. Why they call it the Apostles' Creed? It, it's, so it, it summarizes the Apostles' teaching. That's why it boiled down to that name. It wasn't so much that it didn't come from them, but it was, hey, here's a summary of what they teach. And one of the things I like about what Packer says is that the Apostles' Creed is a great evangelistic tool. I never thought of it like that. But, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a little bit challenging if someone says, well, what, what, what do you guys believe? What do you Christians believe? You can't just, you want to hand them a Bible and say, okay, open up and start here. That's really difficult. And uh, some of y'all know, you know I'm, a, I'm a reserve chaplain now in the Navy, and uh, this past summer, I, I was chaplain here. I got pulled into the COVID quarantine for the Marine Corps. And so when all their, before their recruits, the Marines brought them in for two weeks, and we stayed about three or four months here at the Citadel and, and quarantined them. I mean, it took away everything from them. It was very interesting. You want a, a real sociological, anthropological study is when you take everything away from somebody and put them in a room, see what happens to them. Um, the only thing they could have is religious materials. And so, I mean, no phone, nothing. And so, uh, I mean, you're going through withdrawal symptoms, whether it be nicotine, <laughs> these kids, alcohol, phone, obviously, and you got nothing. I could give them a Bible. And so the discussion is, where do you start reading in the Bible for kids who have zero knowledge? If you open up at Genesis, it's going to be tough. Most of them can make it through Genesis. But when you start getting into Numbers and Deuteronomy, Leviticus, you're like, whoa, what is going on? But then you turn and say, well, okay, go over to the Gospel of Mark or the Gospel of John. Even that, for someone, is throwing them into the deep end. And what Packer says in his book is that you could hand someone, this is an outline of the Christian faith. And it really is true. And so... I, I would encourage you to think of it like that. If someone challenges on your faith, because you can walk through this thing, and it's, I mean, it covers in our bulletin, you know, like a paragraph. But the depth of it is tremendous of what it covers. And the other creeds, again, the three ecumenical, we'll say, you know, get into the Nicene's a little bit longer. It pulls some more things out. Athanasius' Creed is really long, and it's more answering question, like a, like a catechism, teaching. But the Apostles' Creed, it boils down everything you need to know about the Christian faith into a paragraph, which is really quite amazing. Not to say that you stop there. Uh, it's like a lot of things. You can, you can grasp the, simplest, simplistic, the simple message pretty quickly, but the depth of it is a lifetime of study, right? It, you're never going to plumb the depths of the, the whole of the Christian faith. And so... Here's one, one quote from Packer. says that all that the creed covers needs to be grasped and taught as an integral part of the message of the saving love of God. And so he's saying you, you can study this thing and it's going to teach you a whole lot. It's going to teach you about God. And it shows us. And it's divide, you can divide it out in the Trinity. It talks about the Father. It talks about the Son. It talks about the Holy Spirit. All those things are laid out in a pretty simple form. And so... Um, it's the Trinity. It talks about creation, the incarnation, the Holy Spirit, the church, the forgiveness of sin, the Christian hope. And again, it was used early on as a preparation for baptism. Could you affirm the Apostles' Creed? And again, for our early Christians, and even today around the world, baptism often marks the line of persecution. Uh, we spent a year, years ago, in China... Uh, on a, on a, like a one-year mission living in China. Very interesting. Um, to get someone to baptism is huge. You may get a confession of faith, and especially true in the Muslim world, but baptism is seen. They understand it, maybe I think more so than us sometimes. Other faiths will look at that and say, that's, that's, your, that's the line. You're crossing the line. You can talk about Jesus, but when you get baptized, now you've crossed over. And the early Christians saw it the same way. And so that's why they would take up the three years to prepare somebody. And it was this elaborate thing. And, and um, 
the baptism ceremony then for adults was very elaborate, you know, beginning in darkness and when, on Easter morning, uh, men and women lined up separately and differently and come into the church. And it would end as the sun rose. That's where the early sunrise service came from. And so that symbolism of darkness to light, you know, death to life, very neat stuff. We, we've lost a lot of that. But let me, let me stay focused on the Apostles' Creed. And really, if y'all got questions or just, just raise a hand, please feel free to stop and ask something because I'll, I'll get talking and, and won't stop. So I'll try to slow down for a minute. But, you know, the first statement, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Um, two things, one thing to note is a personal statement. I believe. And then it lays it out. But the neat thing is, this is one of those individual, but it's also a communal event because we stand, we say it together. And that's an important part of confessing our faith together as a, as a body. And, and the Christian life is both those things. It's an, it must be grasped individually and embraced, but at the same time, it, we don't live it in separate lives. It's not, it's not an individual faith, even though it's an individual faith. The community, the body of Christ, those things, are, that's why we stop and we say it together as a group confession. And so, you know, really it's to... And that word they use there really means to believe into. You know, that's kind of an, it's not just belief or like knowledge up here, like, okay, yeah, that's good. You know, I understand, I believe God, right? And I always say, you can talk to anybody almost about God. There are very few people who won't even engage you in discussion on God. And that's what a lot of these kids that I dealt with over the summer talk about God easily. But when you move into Jesus, then we begin to see some differences. But we must understand who the Father is first. He's the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. We talk about creation in there. A very thing, important thing. Father Almighty. It means He is self-sufficient. He's, he's Almighty God. He doesn't need us. But He creates and He gives. And so it's the importance of that first statement. Um, and again, it's the, it's the Christian God. I, there was a young man I, I talked with. Man, he, he was, it was, his mother was a, I guess you'd say a, a lapsed Roman Catholic, uh, and his father was Muslim. And he had some really just messed up ideas. And he knew it, which was kind of interesting, and he was happy to talk about it. But, you know, the Muslim understanding of God is very different. And the Christian understanding, you do not believe the lie that's out there that somehow it's the same God. It's vastly different when you understand what they view and think of and see. And so, um, that's just a small point, but when you try to unravel these things for folks, that's when it becomes, that's why I think this is a neat tool to use, is you can use this to say, well, here's who the Christian God is. You see, He's an almighty God who doesn't need you or me, but He creates and gives. It's the heart of the Trinity is the Father. Okay? And that, that idea of a Father who gives and who provides for His people. And so you move on down um, to the second part. It says, In Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. In that statement, again, super short, but that's the basis of what you need to know about Jesus. Who He is, where He came from, what He was doing. It's right there. And so we confess that. We, we, we embrace that. His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the... You know, there's, again, there's the, the, um, the virgin birth, which is so important to understand in Christianity. You take away the virgin birth, and, and you're stopped right there. Interesting, it has Pontius Pilate in there. He makes, <laughs> this guy makes appearances throughout history. What a, I don't know what, what would be the right word to use to describe him, but he may, he's in two of the three creeds. Pontius Pilate. Why is he in there? Any thoughts on, let me stop, I'll try to be more engaging. Why, why, does, Pont, why does good old Pilate make appearance in our creeds? The man who crucified Christ, who had the power. Why do we give him that space? I guess to fix his place in history. 
you know, that this actually did happen and reading about Pontius Pilate and it happened during his exactly. term of governor. Exactly. It's a historical right. statement that fixes this in time and history. Pilate was a, again, he's backwater governor. I don't know what you would equate him to um, in, in our world, or, you know, maybe, uh, maybe whatever, the, probably the, the least desirable government position. I mean, he, he, was, he had some standing, but it was, was not a great spot to get posted to. This was not prime time where he was sent to the backside of the Roman Empire, um, to this kind of rebellious, odd people, these, uh, these Jews who had one God and wouldn't honor all the other Roman gods who were doing their own thing and always rebelling. All right, Pilate, they're yours. But exactly, it, his, Christianity is a historical faith. It's not a leap of faith. It's not some kind of mystical thing, although there are mysteries within it. It is historical. It's fixed. That's why Luke, in his gospel, his Acts of the Apostles, he fixes times and places especially. The others do too. But Luke's a little more uh, detailed in some of these things. When he lays out the birth message of Christ, he names these different people. All historical. Pilate, there's actually... It's one or two other historical references to him. So it's, while the Bible has proved his history very well, there are other. There was an inscription years ago that was found. I don't know if I put it in this note um, that they discovered. Yeah, uh, let's see. No, that was in there somewhere. But there was a a stone found. It wasn't in Jerusalem. It was a different area because Pilate eventually got moved. He wasn't doing a good job. He got fired. And so, but there was some inscriptions that described him. So this dude existed. He was there. He's not just, and that's why he's in our creeds. You would think, why would you put this man in there? But it's that historical aspect that makes Christianity very different. Very different. And it's a long discussion. I was listening to a Muslim convert to Christianity, Muslim background convert. And he talked about it. it was one of the things that drew him to Christianity when he began to compare that the historical things within the Quran didn't add up. You couldn't verify them. Even the distances were off. He said that was a big deal to him, that the distances it described were not accurate. But the ones in the Bible are accurate for someone in that day. To go this far, to walk this way, it would take you about this long. Just little things that add up. And so when our creed throws in Pontius Pilate, it's fixing this in our time and history. Very important aspect. Um, a lot we could say about in there uh, that it was by the Holy Ghost, who born of the Virgin Mary. And here we get it. He was crucified. He was died. He died. He was buried. All again, very important. Again, the Romans, experts at crucifixion. They're, you know, they didn't make mistakes. They didn't. Some of these theories are like, well, maybe Jesus just passed out and all these other. No. They knew what they were doing. They did this on a daily basis. These guys were experts at, at sort of the, the downside of what they did. And, but So it's making that emphasis. So we see the Father, now we see the Son, and begins now probably the most controversial statement, and I won't go into it too much. If we do, um, if Ben decides he wants to do a, some lessons on this, maybe we'll get into it. It says he descended into hell. <laughs> that is a that that one is probably everybody's got questions about that. One. Anybody, what do you think that means? What does that what's it mean? I grew up in the Methodist church, and we had to learn the Apostles' Creed from church membership when we were little. But we did not descend. <laughs> right. Not in what we learned. Okay. And when I saw the light and became a Presbyterian. <laughs> That was a shock yeah. to me. It moved from the asterisk up. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a curious statement, right? Um, and I spent a lot of time, and again, this is one of those, you can find anything out there on this, and so you have to be a little careful of who you listen to and what you read on it. Probably the shortest way to summarize that is the better reading would be descended to the dead. And sometimes you'll see some of that in some of the writings. It's showing that Jesus, he did go somewhere. You know, I guess we can say there's a little bit of where it might have went. Yeah, I've heard that. I forget who it was that I read about. Basically just saying that um, on the cross, suffering the wrath of God, he went through that. Mm-hmm. He literally suffered yeah. death and hell. 
That is, a, I think, yeah, yeah. And that's, I think, is a very good way to look. He suffered the pains of hell and death. No, that, what, I, what I've heard is that um, the punishment for sin is not earthly death, but it's hell. So for him to bear the weight and to take the, that punishment for sin, he has to have gone to hell, whatever that means, mm-hmm. um, separation from God the Father in some way. Um, because that, it, it's not just about worst human uh, there's there's torture methods that could probably have drawn out longer sure than yeah they could have yeah yeah a, a, a greater weight but it's not just a, 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 a right there are though all those things are wrapped up in there you know you go back to the garden of eden you think right when when adam and eve sinned he says and the day you do this you will surely die they didn't die right on the spot you could have killed them right there they eventually would die so Earthly death is a little bit, it is a, it is a side effect of our sin also, but what was the major is the, is the spiritual death, the separation from God in and of that little, that's why the first chapters of Genesis are so important to the Christian faith. We see in there where all this started. We don't really know the whys and, and understand the depth behind it, but Christ is suffering the full, the full wrath of God. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And in there, he is suffering the pains. Yes, he dies physically. But the, the, the wrath of God, it was important that he suffer that on our behalf, that he fulfill that price. And, and it's a very important discussion to the Christian faith when you talk about um, Christ's death as per- Propitiatory, propitiation. It's a big word, but it's so important to us that we don't use it, but we should. That Christ satisfies the wrath of God. Now, people don't like to talk about the wrath of God. That, you know, it's one of those, he's just a kind grandfather, let's stay at that. Yes, no. All right? He is a kind and loving father, but he has all these aspects to him, I guess we might say. Uh, he executes perfect justice. He has to. He can't just wink at sin, as, as some have said, you know, that God will just, that's okay. When what the creed is telling us is that God took his son and put him to death on our behalf. Now, that's a sobering thought. And he suffers this punishment. When we say he descended into hell, and again, it's a good discussion to, to pull out a little further what's going on there. But see, death is a, death is a is that result of sin, of the fall, and so therein is where he has to go to. Whatever he was doing, there is you know, and there's the passage in First or Second Peter that talks about preaching to the. There's a few <laughs> interesting you know, and you get in there, what's really talking about stuff to say it fully. Christ descends into death, which is the result of our sin. That spiritual death, he suffers it physically. That's important. He suffers it spiritually. He fulfills it. And that's when it can say, that's why it said earlier, died, buried, descends to hell. Now we go to the final part. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. Um, again, all the mission of Christ. Christ gets the focus of this. You'll see, you know, a little bit of the Father. Christ gets the majority of it. We'll touch a little bit on the Holy Spirit and some other parts. But it's important that he rose again. You know, this is, this is all these things are crucial to the Christian faith. Death, burial, resurrection. We like to say, you know, Jesus died for you. I mean, that's a true thing. But that's, that's, a, that's the only part of it. He lived, he died, he rose again for you. All those are very important. And so he ascended into heaven. The Bible tells us that he, he returns to the Father, sits at the right hand of the Father. Why? As an advocate for us. And so I think it's so good that we can look and see we have the Holy Spirit who dwells with us. Jesus says, it's good that I go away. So you can get the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus, fully man, fully, fully God, fully man, he was limited. He willingly limited himself on his time on earth. Took on our, our human body. So one place at one time. When he's gone, we get the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells with all believers. And so as we all we have him, our, our brothers and sisters, wherever they may be worshiping around the world, he's there with them also. Advocating. To see we also have Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father, the important aspect of the of the right hand, you know, the right hand man. The, that's such an important thing. Um, that position of honor. And we'll see in our passage today a little bit from Luke that we'll touch on it. You know, throughout the Old Testament, you'll, there is a, uh, some threads, some statements talking about the arm of the Lord. That's a fascinating study if you want to trace that through there. It's very messianic in its meaning. And so here we see Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father where he says he lives to intercede for us. But then it also promises us He's going to come and judge the quick and the dead. The quick, living, and sometimes you'll see it translated that. That's the more modern version, we would say, the living. So whenever he returns, whoever's, if whoever's here, there will be judgment. He will judge the living. He will judge the dead. So we see that second part of him, right? That's why I think it's an important thing to note as we enter Advent. Today's the first Sunday of Advent. Very important in the Christian calendar as we think on that. When Jesus enters Jerusalem, what does he enter Jerusalem on when he enters? What's he riding? Donkey. Typically, not always, kings rode donkeys when they were on a peace mission. Donkey's not a very uh, aggressive animal <laughs> necessarily, unless, they're, unless you've been around. They could be a little bit ornery, but, um, but so he would ride a donkey. In Revelation, what does Jesus return on? A horse. War horse. And so we see a different aspect. He's coming. And so we must understand both sides of Jesus. Not both sides. That's not a, a great way to express it, but the full aspect of who he is. And he was here on a peace mission. But when he comes back, it's different. And that's why we must be ready. That's why we proclaim the good news. That's what it's telling us here. It says judgment will come. It will come. And so the final uh, little section of the creed that I broke out is, is a little bit kind of the catch-all statement. It says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. It touches on the Holy Spirit. He probably gets the least attention in this. It doesn't really say a lot about him, which is too bad, but um, he probably is the most difficult one of the Trinity to understand. We must not forget the Holy Spirit is God. It's a person. He's not, it's not the force. It's not this, again, uh, you know, we all may struggle with a little bit difficult. How do we describe the Holy Spirit? You know, something unseen can be difficult, but He is part of the Trinity. He is God. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And so, in the Holy Catholic Church, this always gets some people. And some will, you'll see it sometimes as the Christian church. Um, what's Catholic mean? Universal. Universal. Universal, some of the whole, all of the parts. Uh, you know, and I, that's why I think there's a great distinction. I think we should not give up saying Catholic. And, and, and it's why is because it identifies us with all the believers around the world. It pulls us together. And that's one of those, because um, it, it, it goes right into the next statement, the communion of saints. That's a very important thing, you know, of those in heaven and on earth. Um, communion of saints can be a little bit challenging to understand. We, we have communion of saints here, but what about the rest of those before us? Are they totally withdrawn from the picture? It can be a little tricky to answer what's going on up there. Uh, I don't know, one of my uh, fellow chaplain buddy years ago uh, was a charismatic Episcopal, really interesting guy. You know? um, but he would describe it, he says, think of it like a sports stadium. People who are alive, you're the ones on the field, you're in the game, but those who've gone before, they're the ones in the stands watching you. 
I don't know, it's an imperfect illustration, but it kind of makes sense to me. You know, the, <laughs> the saints are up there. They're watching us. We, we have fellowship with them. We have fellowship with those around the world. To not get lost with the Christians um, who, granted, we're maybe, there are differences for some around the world from us, but we can still unite. That's why this creed unites us to a lot of people who we couldn't otherwise be united to. That We can agree on this one. And so we have that fellowship. We have that connection with them. And so um, when, you, when you say this, when you say this creed, when you use it, um, think on that. It's a good time to stop to pray for those uh, our brothers and sisters around the world who really do risk a lot to come together. We, we, we don't hear yet, uh, but those around the world do. And so, but we have that connection. Um, forgiveness of sins is so important. That's why we're here. If Christianity was only about self-help, we can go home and do something else. There's other things we could do on, on a Sunday morning, probably. But the forgiveness of sins, that's why, that's why, I think that's why that's listed at the bottom, is because that doesn't happen without all this stuff rolling down from the top. If the Father does not act in love. Remember John 3.16, it says that God so loved the world. We, we want to throw him out sometimes as either a cranky grandfather, you know, that doesn't care. And Jesus had to bring some love to the world. Not so. God the Father loved the world. And so it rolls down till we get to the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body. There's that promise that he, we will be with him. It's not, it's not empty-handed. Part of the reason he rose visibly. We will raise bodily with Christ. Perfected body. It's a good thing. You know? Uh, but that is part of the promise of God. And the final one, to life everlasting. And that, that's, that's the, the celebratory end. You know, there's eternal... In one sense, you can say there is eternal life for everybody. It's where you're going to spend it. What are you going to be doing for the rest of your eternity? You know, there is, the, there is the life everlasting. And we could say death everlasting, death that never ends. Um, John Owens, the English Puritan, wrote an, It's an interesting title of his book. It's the death of death and the death of Christ. And you've got to slow down to say it. But in that statement alone, for the Christian, he was put death to death by his death and his resurrection. And a powerful thing for us, for those outside of Christ, it's eternal death. Not separation from God. I think there's the presence of God's wrath. Is the, that's why it's there. The justice of God. And so uh, that should motivate us, hopefully, Advent's a great time of year to, Christmas season's a great time of year to invite people to church. More open, I think, now than any time. Sometimes Easter, some people will, we, um, there's a Navy chaplain who once used to call them the Christers. You know, <laughs> we come at Christmas and Easter. I'm like, that's great. You know, I wish you'd come often. But why ever or whenever you come, our church must be ready. And you, this is the easiest time to invite someone. Hey, it's Christmas. You know, we've got a Christmas Eve service coming up. Come on out. So, you know, it's a good... I like, one thing I like about our church is that we don't spotlight people, you know, visitors. When I, church, the church I grew up in as a kid, visitors stand up. And I'm like, oh, man, would you not hate that? Um, you know, really call you out. Say, everybody say hello to them. And you're like, oh. Um, <laughs> But I have to tell you this because sure. my father was a professional Boy Scout. Uh huh. Yeah. So on Scout Sunday, he and others oh, would right. go to a certain church with all the Scouts. Right. And they went to this church that had the really long altar calls that uh -huh. we to go. Yep. And the, they sang just as I am like <laughs> twenty. And he said the five, minister finally stopped the notes. My dad was reading the executive. He said. We have to keep going because we know there are three people here who are not saved. Wow. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> and my dad said, you didn't think they were ever going yeah, we're to get Ever going to get out of somebody. Just please, somebody go forward, right? No, I didn't. It made me think of that because 
I understand that's that's a lot like. (laughs) Just three, too, right? No, that, yeah, a lot like the church I grew up in. We, yeah, I mean, about 10 verses of just as I am. And, you know, that, that's a, it's an interesting, you could, you could talk a lot about that. You know, when, when Jesus, Jesus didn't stand around begging people. He commanded us to follow me and come on. You know, now, Paul says we persuade men, and so we should. And so there is a, you can take this tool. Somebody asks you, what do you believe? What's your church believe? Well, here it is in a paragraph. Especially in our day, and I don't know, that might even fit, fit in a tweet. I don't know, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not, um, I don't have, I'm <laughs> still holding out against social media. But, um, you know, it, it would almost fit in there. In our day and age when people have a challenging to get somebody to sit down and read in-depth things, and you really want to say, well, this is what we believe. And then you can start there. And let the Holy Spirit do the work He's supposed to do, to open their minds, to convict. But you got a great summary of Christian doctrine right here before you. Every Sunday we say it. And so I hope you'll embrace it. Again, i got a few other books, but I'll just say Packer, that's a great read on it. And then really open your eyes. And, and, and so we'll, we'll pause there. Let's see, we've got a few minutes. So any questions, thoughts, comments? Yes. I think we do. We do in a, in a sense. I'm not sure how you would exactly describe that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, you know, that there's a connection to them. We don't pray to them. We don't do a lot of that stuff. But there is a connection of the church, the people who've gone before us, that we have a fellowship with them. I think part of it would be the fact that uh, they are already in the presence of God and they are worshiping. Right. That aspect, we we have that in common, yeah. and we look forward to that. That's why I talk about without the understanding of eternity, that last statement, mm-hmm. the eternal life without eternity, what do we do? Right. Do nothing. Right. That's why the eternal aspect is such a big deal because we'll someday join them in the present. You know, right right now, dimly. Yes. Yeah. Right. Have, also, right. Also, it seems like uh, the Holy Spirit unites us. Mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit is in us. Still. Yes. Uh, and so that unites us. Yeah, absolutely. I think that that is a great. It's a great point. Of the Holy Spirit is what it binds us with other Christians on earth, and it makes that connection. They are, as Revelation shows us, you know, the great throne room, the worshiping around God, and the multitudes of the people. And so, um, you know, again, we don't need to pray to them. They're not praying for us, but there there is a connection. And so. Um, we're part of that larger body of family, of those who've gone before us and those who will come after us. We're, we hopefully are leaving, um, I forget who it was said it, but Christianity is a, you know, it's, it's basically a one-generation faith. If, if the next generation does not embrace and accept, then, you know, maybe raised in a Christian family, that's a good thing and taught, but if you don't believe it and carry it on, and so the Holy Spirit helps generate, helps power that, helps connect that, helps open those eyes and minds. It's the Holy Spirit. You know, we talk about redemption in here. You know, the, the Father designs and plans redemption. He planned it. Christ, um, Christ accomplished it. The Holy Spirit applies it. And they're each involved. They're not all, you know, the Father's not uninvolved. But it's the Holy Spirit's main mission to apply redemption. So each part of the Trinity is working through that. And so, and part of, you know, again, the historical faith is necessary. What what our fathers of our faith have left for us, we need to pass on. 